Welcome back, everybody. In this lecture, as was promised in the previous one, my aim is to give you a little bit more context around where psychology came from and to give you an understanding of the path that we underwent as the field was starting to develop and become what it is today. Now, it's probably important to note that this is going to be a very abridged version of the history of psychology. In fact, almost every major research institution out there offers a course on its own that covers the ebbs and flows of psychology as it was starting to become a true science and also looked at how the different theorists and ideas and movements shaped psychology today. We won't get into that much detail, but hopefully after leaving this lecture, you do have a better understanding of how it came about and also some of the major figures in the history of psychology, even if it's just a small sample of all the individuals that really shaped psychology into what it is today. So let's start with talking about where psychology came from. In psychology's early infancy years, what it really was was kind of an attempt to find ways to scientifically study ideas about the mind that philosophers and biologists had been exploring for years or even centuries. There were always ideas that we might want to try to understand how the mind and body were separate or what caused the behavior that we were committing, something that we were doing in our minds or something that was kind of preordained from the environment or from some spiritual being. And also what caused individual differences to emerge in the first place. These major debates, what we now call the mind-body-brain problem, back then it was called the mind-body problem, the free will versus determinism debate, and the nature versus nurture debate, were things that were around long before psychology was even a fledgling science. And they were discussed by philosophers and people across a wide range of different professions for centuries. But in the really early 1500s, mid 1600s, people started asking if there were ways to actually study these concepts. Major philosophers started seeking out ways of verifying whether or not the mind and brain were actually separated. And it eventually led in the 1600s and 1700s people to really kind of come up with obscure ways of studying their own topics of interest. And then in the 1800s, mid 1800s, people started to find ways to connect biological mechanisms and the research behind studying them with the philosophical concepts, the mind-body problem, the free will versus determinism problem, and the nature versus nurture to problem, just to name a few of the many things that were discovered. And in doing so, the first really steps to forming psychology came about. Our very first psych labs in psychology, because of their roots in biology, focused a lot on the topics of sensation and perception. Most people in the early stages of psychology were very insistent that to become a true science, to separate ourselves out from philosophy, we should limit the scope of what we were looking at. People like Wilhelm Wundt, who established the very first psychological lab in really the world, decided to set up a st set of studies and a lab itself to study the basic processes of sensation and perception. He, in Leipzig, Germany, developing his first lab, created all of these different devices so he could measure down to the millisecond sometimes the response patterns that people gave to a variety of different stimuli. And even though a lot of his approaches and his measurements and results that he reported were uh, kind of hyper-focused on specific topics, we do still to this day see many applications to his work. In fact, one of my favorite examples of this is something that you might unknowingly encounter when you watch cartoons or other television shows. 
Woot was one of the very first people to show that our expectations of when we should see, have, not see, but hear specific sounds or should, are, are not always aligned with what we actually hear or what we see. So in a number of studies, what he would do is ask people to tap when they expect to, to hear a sound or to kind of indicate verbally when they expected to have something occur. And what he kept finding was that people tended to expect a sound to actually happen before it occurred. Not at a point where it was a second or so before it occurred, but just a fraction of a second before it occurred. Now, if we were taking this class in person, what I would do is my very not famous, but very popular key experiment where I would take a set of keys, dangle them on top of a table and ask two students to tap the table when they heard the sound. But one individual when doing it would tap when they saw the keys falling and kind of tap when they were expecting to see it where the other student was asked to tap with their eyes closed. And what we consistently find in this activity is that the person watching the keys drop always taps a fraction of a second, about a quarter second before the person who has their eyes closed, even though both individuals are instructed only to tap after they heard the sound. And this highlights the effect that Voon discovered that our timing is a little bit off and we have to sometimes adjust accordingly to make things look more in sync. Walt Disney, actually, one of the, the famous uh, cartoonists over the years, I guess we could say, actually used these ideas and these discoveries of Voontz in his original movies that he created. And this is actually still something this to this day that we use to present television shows and movies and other things that have audio and visual information presented actually on different mediums sync up. Unbeknownst to you, the sound is usually a little bit faster than the images that we're seeing. And it's because it's sped up, because for most of us, when we perceive it, it looks like it's aligned correctly. These are, of course, just samplings of Wundt's work. Other people in other labs that started to form in the, the late 1800s studied things like memory or basic processes of understanding how to, to kind of pay attention to stuff. It was always very limited in scope, though, and it was limited in scope intentionally. Because, again, this is where people wanted to kind of carve out their niche to what made psychology a unique profession. After the work of Wundt, others began to kind of explore the interplay between functions of the mind and just the basic processes of it as well. One very famous theorist slash researcher was a gentleman named Edward Titchener, who was also one of the very first psychologists in the United States after he worked with Wundt at his lab out in Leipzig, Germany. When Titchener came back, he focused a lot of his attention on the concept of what was called structuralism and a process that was actually championed by Wundt called introspection. Structuralism essentially tried to understand not just the basic elements of perception, but how those elements came together to form what it was we were experiencing. And my favorite examples to highlight this approach is something I call the orange example, where I put an orange in front of you and I ask you what it is that you're seeing. Most people automatically, in just an instance, identify that they're looking at an orange. But then we usually probe a little bit more closely. We ask, well, what led you to believe that was that that was an orange? If I say took away the stem, would you still see it as an orange? If I took away the color, would you still see it as an orange? What if I took away the shine or the pockmarks? You know, what were the critical components in essence for you to be able to determine that that thing that you were looking at was an orange? And in Titchener's lab, he not only would sometimes probe through these questions that we talked about, but he would sometimes alter information, trying to figure out how the mind was able to compile things together 
to make better sense of our reality. It still followed under the kind of logical progressions that we saw with Wundt. It was still studying basic processes of the mind, but it was expanding into a world where we were looking at not just how the mind decoded things, but how the mind combined a lot of elaborate information into something that we sort of then were able to simplify. And it really issued in this new era of people exploring new processes of the mind, new ideas that went beyond to really a need to form what psychology was all about. Now we're looking at who the champion of defining psychology was in the early years of this field. Most people tend to cite the gentleman named William James that you see pictured here on the right. James is partially known for his focus on this idea of something called functionalism, this obsession with not only figuring out how things work, but why they're there in the first place and, and what its utility is. And a great example of this is with memory. If we look at the work of Hermann Ebbinghaus or even Wilhelm Wundt or Edward Titchener, their focus would be on things like what the capacity of memory was, how it actually worked, what, what we're able to kind of keep in our heads. James is more interested in why we had memory in the first place. What would happen if it wasn't there? What it kind of gave us as an advantage if we had better memory than other individuals. And through this new approach to trying to kind of tease out why things existed and how they were categorized, it led James to develop what many people consider the most influential book in psychology ever. It was a book that he entitled The Principles of Psychology. It was published in 1890. And it was this comprehensive book that tried to lay out what psychology was, what the areas of psychology that could be explored were, and how we could potentially try to tackle this broad, overarching thing of the mind through actual concrete research. And a lot of the layout of that book and things that James insisted we should study are actually still in our current world of psychology today. Many of you might notice if you've looked at multiple intro to psych books that they're all usually organized the exact same way. The first chapter is always about an introduction to giving a broad overview of psychology. The second usually focuses on biological mechanisms of the mind, even though some have moved now statistics into the second chapter. And the third is either biology or statistics. And then we move into sensation and perception. And we usually then, after that, move into the, the basic principles of memory, then development. There's this nice logical progression that almost every book goes through, and it actually is reflected in that first textbook that James wrote over 130 years ago. And it really highlights and of how much James impact its psychology for decades, at this point now almost a century, well, more than a century, after he wrote this very influential book. So even though functionalism is important, I think understanding that he was one of the first authors of a comprehensive summary of psychology is probably the most critical thing that you need to associate with this individual. Things in psychology? It's probably not Edward Titchener or Wilhelm Wundt or even William James that you've heard of before. Instead, it's probably the gentleman you see pictured on this slide. The very controversial within the field of psychology, at least individual named Sigmund Freud, who in the early 1900s decided to study his own areas of interest in psychology. And for those of you that don't know much about Freud, we'll explore his history a little bit later. But understand that Freud was a major player in the development of psychology when he attempted to understand individual differences and mental health problems through his own approach that he called the psychodynamic approach. And this approach explored lots of things that early psychologists were unwilling to look at. It explored hidden components to the mind, the interaction between spirituality and the mind, and lots of other sort of pseudoscientific ideas that had been tethered to the mind in philosophy, 
but psychologists had tried to steer clear of. And when he started exploring these things, his popularity and the field of psychology sort of took off. When he published the book entitled The Interpretation of Dreams in 1900, many and many people flocked to psychology, and in particular his areas of psychology, clinical psychology and personality, in their attempts to better understand what made us tick. Now, many psychologists, even at the time, sort of celebrated this upswell in the field, but they also quickly identified the not-so-good side effects from this upswell in popularity. They recognized that many people flocking to the field had decided to kind of abandon the rigor that many early psychologists were trying to impose on researchers looking at their field, and instead just study whatever random topic they wanted to study in whatever random way they wanted to, arguing through whatever approach they developed that they were being scientific and psychologists in their studies. And this really irked a lot of people in the early 1900s, and it eventually led to this schism within the field, where some people embraced the popularity and the ideas of Freud, while others... what they argued had been theirs, and in doing so, really returned psychology back to its research roots. And the thing that sort of formed as a, a direct response to Freud and other things that were happening in the field of psychology was this movement in the late 1910s, really 1920s for the most part, called the behavioral movement. And the behavioral movement argued that even though lots of topics that psychologists had started to study, like emotions, like motivation, like drives and, and clinical psych, might be very enticing, they were also fraught with lots of problems. And they were taking the world of psychology in the wrong place. So instead, what we should do until we've perfected better techniques is to try to minimize what it is we can look at with respect to the human mind in scientific terms. This eventually led to people often talking about this thing called behaviorism, an attempt to understand the mind not by looking at thoughts and processes of the mind, but just the manifestation of those thoughts and processes in our actually overt behaviors. And for around a decade or two, many people that started to call themselves true psychologists focus their intentions or attention in processes of the mind. And this idea persisted actually for a number of decades until people started to not only break away from just studying behavioral topics, but started to argue that behaviorism could never really truly explain everything that we were interested in. In the 1970s, the field of psychology as a whole underwent this thing that was called the cognitive revolution. But in reality, this was something that had been coming for a number of decades. Even though most people steered away from motivation and emotions after the behavioral movement, there were still people studying things, even from a behavioral perspective, that identified that just looking at overt behaviors was insufficient. And if we truly wanted to understand not only human, but also animal behavior, we had to look at more things like how we were responding to a situation internally, what our kind of overarching drives were when we were doing these things. We also found numerous studies that could not be explained through basic behavioral principles when we looked at memory and development. Clinical psychology was also an area that lots of people were dying to know more about that just couldn't be explained very well in basic behavioral terms. Paired that with the fact that many behaviorists had again argued that we should study the mind in a very concrete way until we developed other tools, and well, we had started to develop other tools in the 1970s. Or that with that general movement within the field, and we see where the cognitive revolution really took hold in the 1970s. And what it did was it really opened And what it's led to is essentially what we talked about in our previous class, a very broad overarching field where people get 
degrees and pursue areas of interest that are not always perfectly overlap with other people that call themselves psychologists. Now, it's important to note that in current psychological branches, there is a big insistence on trying to study stuff through a research-oriented approach. It's a still essentially what we think separates us from other areas of interest, like pop culture, media research, or maybe even philosophy. And if we're looking at where this leaves us, what I want us to understand is that we're in a very broad area that still has roots within our basic elements of, kind of what psychology was when it first formed. And we're going to see a lot of this manifested in some of our early discussions of branches of psychology that came about in those early 19th After we've gone over this, you have a better grasp of what makes psychology what it is. You've also had a chance to read chapter one and a couple other things that maybe could help clarify stuff. And that you've had a chance to really get ready for them, leave the homework that's here, but all the stuff that you need to do for next week. If you're there, you're all caught up, give yourself a pat on the back, congratulations on getting through your first week. And I'm hoping I will see many of you soon, either via our discussions or next week in these lectures. For now, take care, everybody. I'll see you soon.